the FTSE 250 actually outperformed the S&P 500, which mm-hmm. I think when you tell most people that, they're like, hold on, how, yeah. how's that possible? 25 mm-hmm. years up to 2023, the FTSE 250 is at 714% or 8.74 on an annual basis. The S&P was 702 Die Geldmeisterin, der Finanzpodcast mit Julia Kistner. Die großen europäischen Wahlen sind geschlagen, Zeit sich jetzt wieder auf die entsprechenden Börsen zu fokussieren. Der breite britische Aktienindex FTSE 250 hat zum Beispiel innerhalb des einen Monats den letzten um 5% zulegen können, davon alleine 2% letzte Woche nach der Wahl der Insulaner. Bevor wir uns die Folgen der UK-Wahlen für den britischen Kapitalmarkt im Detail ansehen und auch noch einen kurzen Blick auf die französische Börse nach dem dort vorgezogenen Parlamentswahlen werfen, schauen wir doch auf die Superaktienheroes des Vormonats Juni. Von denen gab es eigentlich viele, denn ein Großteil der Aktien hat sich zuletzt in neuen Rekordhöhen emporgeschwungen. Den weltweiten Börsenhype ausgelöst hat am 12. Juni die Veröffentlichung der US-amerikanischen Verbraucherpreise, wonach die Inflation im Mai auf 3,3 Prozent zurückging, also es von der Seite keinen Grund gibt, für die US-Notenbank im Herbst nicht weiter die Zinsen zu senken, was ja normalerweise ein großer Motivator für die Börsen ist. Wie immer haben aber manche Aktien auch im Juni überperformt. Unter den Highflyern war wiederum, richtig, Nvidia. Und das, obwohl nach Berechnungen der Börseinfoplattform Seeking Alpha Nvidia nach Gewinnmitnahmen bei AI und Halbleiterwerten am 25. Juni kurz einmal 500 Milliarden US-Dollar an Börsenwert verloren hat. Seit Jahresbeginn ist Nvidia aber nichtsdestotrotz alles in allem 150 Prozent gestiegen. Ein Bestperformer im Juni war auch Mitbewerber SMCI Super Microcomputer, der ebenso von KI-Hype profitiert und stark profitabel ist. Was man aber ähnlich wie bei Nvidia derzeit mit einem hohen Kurs bezahlt. SMCI hat seit Jahresbeginn über 220 Prozent zugelegt. Aber wen vielleicht nicht jede Frau als Top-Performer im Juni auf den Schirm hat, ist ein Textilriese, über den die Geldmeisterin allerdings schon zu Beginn des Jahres einmal positiv erstaunt war. Abercombie Fitch hat in den letzten zwölf Monaten um rund 413 Prozent zugelegt. Der Textilriese hat davon im letzten Halbjahr allein knapp 93 Prozent gewonnen. Für einen Neueinstieg in Abercombie ist es aber meiner Meinung nach nun wirklich zu spät. Die Börse schaut bekanntlich ohne dies voraus und dafür gibt es momentan auch statt Glaskugel Geschäftsberichte und die in den USA schon begonnene Berichtssaison. Die begann allerdings mit einer Bruchlandung der umsatzstärksten US-Fluglinie Delta Airlines am vergangenen Donnerstag. Der Aktienkurs der Delta Airlines sackte aufgrund der schlechten Aussichten für das dritte Quartal 24 gleich einmal um 10 Prozent ab. Ja, es wird nach Covid zwar wieder kräftig geflogen, aber es herrschen so starke Überkapazitäten in der Luft, die bei deutlich gestiegenen Wartungskosten zu starken Preisnachlässen führen. Damit haben auch die anderen Airlines stark zu kämpfen derzeit. Kurzfristig also schöne Aussichten für die Passagiere. Gute Bilanzen haben hingegen die US-Bankaktien veröffentlicht. Den Banken geht es weltweit ganz gut. Aktien von Banken und Versicherungen gelten heuer vor allem auf der anderen Seite des Teiches, also in Europa, als die Wachstumsmotoren der europäischen Börsen. Lohnt es sich da nicht, sich im gebeutelten Frankreich jetzt umzuschauen? Oh, was ich vor zwei Wochen gesagt habe, wiederhole ich sehr gerne hier nochmals. Politische Börsen haben kurze Beine und es lohnt sich immer, den französischen Aktienmarkt nach den kräftigen Rücksetzern nach Börsenperlen abzuwässern. Nachdem die politische Platzstellung nach den Wahlen die Börse vorerst belastete, dürften einige Börsenperlentaucher sich schon im französischen Gewässern 
umschauen. Mitte der Woche erholte sich nämlich der Leitindex K40. Gefragt waren vor allem die Luxusgüter wie LVMH, der Konzern, und der Automobilkonzern Stellantis. Zu meinen persönlichen französischen Favoriten, die ich auch in meinem Portfolio behalte, sind Mautbetreiber Vinci, dessen Mauteinnahmen gesetzlich inflationsgeschützt sind und die Frankreichs Autobahn beherrschen und auch der Rückversicherer Score. Komme politisch was wolle, das Geschäftsmodell ist intakt. Politische Stabilität ist das, was derzeit Großbritannien den Börsen bieten kann, im Gegensatz zu Frankreich, die das auch gebührend honorieren. So tanzen nach dem Erdrutschsieg der gewerkschaftsnahen Labour-Partei die Bullen auf den britischen Börsenparkett. Hauptsache klare politische Verhältnisse. Der britische Sterling stieg, die Londoner Börse legte zu und man könne in den nächsten Monaten weiterhin mit einer Outperformance britischer Aktien rechnen, erklärt mein Podcast-Gast Duncan Green, UK Fondsmanager bei Schroders. Bevor ich ihn zu Wort kommen lasse, spoilere ich kurz seine Hauptargumente, die durchaus plausibel klingen, warum ich mich mit britischen Aktien eindecken sollte. Erstens, die noch geringe Anzahl an Börsengängen in Großbritannien deuten darauf hin, dass wir noch nicht am Höhepunkt des Bullenmarktes sind. Als positiven jüngsten Börsengang nennt Duncan Green einzig den Computerproduzenten Raspberry Pi, dessen Komponenten weltweit im Einsatz sind. Zweitens, die Bewertungen in Großbritannien sind noch extrem günstig und könnten durch die politische Stabilität Rückenwind bekommen. Drittens, die britischen Pensionsfonds sind stark unterinvestiert in die Unternehmen aus dem eigenen Land. Sie, sie besitzen gerade einmal 1,6 Prozent der britischen Aktien gegenüber 33 Prozent noch in den 90er Jahren. Also da könnte natürlich eine Leberpartei auch gesetzlich oder einfach sonstigen Druck machen, auf die Pensionskassen im eigenen Land zu investieren. Viertens, die Börse schrumpft. Das Angebot geht durch die Listings und vor allem regen Aktienrückkäufen zurück. Gleichzeitig steigt aber die Nachfrage nach britischen Aktien. Spannend auch eine Studie seiner Schroders Kollegen, wonach der FTSE 250 in den letzten 25 Jahren sogar den S&P 500 outperformte. Großbritannien verfüge eben über starke Midcap-Perlen, die in ihren Nischen mit hohen Eintrittsbarrieren sehr erfolgreich sind. In jedem Fall erlebt Großbritannien gerade seinen größten politischen Wandel seit vielen, vielen Jahren und der günstig bewertete Londoner Aktienmarkt ist ein Blick wert. Oder nicht danken? Ja, yeah, you're completely right. The, the UK is going through its biggest political change since Brexit, as Labour Party has won a landslide mandate to govern. And Keir Starmer will be the first Labour Prime Minister since May uh, 2010. And moreover, the change in seats compared to the 2019 election with Boris Johnson is actually one of the largest political swings in UK's history. So it was a real clear like, vote for change. Uh, the, the election results, though, themselves were very much expected. Uh, I have to admit, I did not stay up all night to watch the votes come in. Uh, I woke up on the Friday and uh, up for the day the results were announced and, you know, the markets were very much subdued. Um, mm -hmm. Ster Sterling was up marginally, UK equities were up marginally uh, and probably as you'd expect, the more domestically focused FTSE 250 uh, was doing a bit better than the large peers of the FTSE 100. Uh, so the results were very much priced in and the opinion polls um, Pretty accurate, really. So that's good. But you're right in terms of the economy. Uh, it is worth noting that the UK economy and the UK stock market are not always, you know, one of the same thing. Around 75% of the UK listed companies, uh, the revenue comes from overseas. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the impact on the underlying companies isn't as large as sometimes uh, one might expect. However, the sentiment towards the UK should improve with political certainty. And if some flows could return to the UK after quite you know, a decade or so of outflows, then a valuation gap, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. And as you know, we've had quite a unstable political environment since 2019. We've had three prime ministers, five <laughs> chancellors. So it's very difficult for companies and businesses to kind of 
invest or anticipate what might change. Mm -hmm. So the importance of stability, I don't think should be overlooked from the perspective of investors, especially now when you're looking overseas with other countries like France and the US, we are now actually looking (laughs) at the stable one. Um, We had Rachel Reeves, the new chancellor, the first female to hold that position, I might add. She had her first speech yesterday and Mm -hmm. it's very much around a new growth focus approach. Um, you know, it's going to give priority to energy projects already underway, uh, expanding into other infrastructure sectors and kind of really making the UK a bit more of an attractive place for foreign investment. That should be the top of the, the government's uh, priorities. On your LinkedIn page, you cite Warren Buffett in reference to an article of your colleague Graham Ashby with... Be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. Does this now apply to the British capital market, you think? Absolutely. I mean, um, equity investing isn't, uh, it always carries risks. Mm-hmm. And contrarian investors, uh, which is the article my, my colleague Graham Ashby kind of put out, argued things can only get better. And mm-hmm. uh, you know who better who better than Warren Buffett to kind of uh, follow his his <laughs> advice. And to be honest, you know we we looked at um, the, the Labour Party because they recently highlighted that the UK equity market does better when mm-hmm. they're in their own power. And we're like, okay, that's interesting. So we looked at the data, and it's interesting to see that the the, the mid size FTSE 250 did outperform the FTSE 100 significantly, but but more on the kind of the contrarian article that my colleague put. He is, there's four points that he wanted. To, uh, the the first one was the shortage of IPOs. I mean, yeah. as a contrarian indicator, history clearly shows that you, uh, IPO activity typically corresponds with a short term peak in equity mm-hmm. markets. And if you look at the levels of IPO activity in 2008 and then in 2021, they were at you know all time highs at those points, but then they subsequently underperformed. And then we've now had a current kind of period where there's no IPOs at all, and the valuation is very low. So it's a good contrarian indicator that no IPOs is the time to get involved. And we are now maybe seeing the start, very early start of IPOs coming back to the market. We had a company called Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is a maker of computer components that's used globally. This uh, came onto the market. It's the first major one we've had in quite a while last month. Mm-hmm. It's done very well since, since IPOing. And it's a fantastic company, strong track record of value creation. And it's got its large kind of cornerstone investors like Arm and Sony kind of, you know, participating in that raise. So I know it's only one, and uh, but it's a very young growth tech company out of the UK, which is doing well. So hopefully this kind of is a precedent for more to come and maybe, you know, as well, the mm-hmm. performance. Uh, the second point was the extreme Uh, valuation kind of differential right now. And this is why we probably prefer within the the UK, uh, the FTSE 250 and the smaller cap, but valuations on a whole are attractive across the piece versus uh, the US and Europe. But focusing just on the the, the FTSE 250 and the level of uh, price to earnings, just as one value uh, measure, it currently nearly sits at 40% below its 25 year average to the MSCI World Index. So this really is quite unprecedented. And, you know, this is why also you're seeing uh, so many incoming bids from an M&A perspective coming into the UK. You know, clearly foreign bidders are seeing the opportunity to uh, attract, uh, to get these attractive assets. And uh, and then the other point is just the FTSE 250 normally trades more expensively than the older kind of economy FTSE 100. You know, it's, that's that, that's that's got more commodities in it, more consumer staples, health, defense, you know, real old school economy. But uh, that means it normally trades at less less of a value pre, uh, valuation than the FTSE 250, but that's completely flipped in the last few years. Mm-hmm. So the FTSE 250 is now a 20% discount to its you know its history there. So in a couple of relative areas, we think there's a, a good value there. And then the third point is on the UK pension funds yeah, uh, here in the UK. We it, it's it's terrible really. Like uh, <laughs> they've been increasingly getting the chore. And they've just reduced their alloc- allocations to equities to in a, in, a, in a way to better manage their liabilities. And the data from the UK's Office of National Statistics shows that domestic pension funds only own about 1.6% of the UK <laughs> market compared to about 33% back in the 1990s. 
And, you know, this is less than four and a half percent of the global MSCI index. So we're, we're underweight our own country, which seems. <laughs> and if you look at uh, other countries, you know, the US is over 60 domestically mm. kind of biased. Uh, France is 26, Australia is 38%. You know, <laughs> it, it's, it, we really are an outlier. And we're not trying to say that the UK has to mandate pensions to hold UK stocks just because they're UK equity. But the fact is the performance of our pension funds has been very poor relative to these overseas pension funds. And that is because they've not held the equity. So a review, a review really needs to be taken on to whether, you know, we've provided good value for money and is there an impetus to kind of make sure that we put more money into it? Why should they now invest more in the British economy? Yeah, no, good question. You know, you're, you're, you're looking at 10, 20 plus year horizons. And, uh, you know, we've seen that not holding equity for all these years since the 90s. We've lost out on such huge potential of opportunity. And that's not just alarming for the pension funds, but the capital that would have gone to companies to to grow and to then, you know, push forward and help the economy grow. There's been a lot of lobbying going on in the UK over the last year, you know, previous government and now also, thankfully, Labour seems like they've listened, where they've, through the Mansion House Compact Agreement last year, 10 of the largest insurers have agreed to put 5% of their uh, kind of pension fund into UK equities and unlisted equities. And, you know, this will turn its attention, this will then drive investment into homegrown businesses and deliver greater returns to pensioners, uh, savers over time. So Labour in the last kind of two days, I mean, it's every hour you look at the TV or the news screen, there's, there's another announcement, but they have committed to a broad review uh, of the suite of the UK pension issues. And they've also now set up a government um, uh, to for a proposal for a national wealth fund. So, you know, we've got many from wealth funds around the country, the Norges Investment Bank being the best one. But, you know, it shows you the, the advantage of having this domestically large wealth fund or pension funds investing domestically, how, how well that can help the economy. So you believe that there will be some legal restrictions that they have to invest more in the, in, in the yeah. own economy? I, I mean, the, the details are going to be very hard to come by. Yeah. Um, um, definitely not a lawyer. I think something will come. I, I, I can't tell you exactly what. And I think that thankfully there's a review going into it. Uh, but lots needs to be done in this space. The, the, the UK has had years and years of outflows. And that's uh, not just from overseas investors who have kind of thought after Brexit, we can't invest there. It's, it's also our, our own domestic kind of funds that have mm -hmm. also taken money out. The fourth one, yeah, shrinking UK stock market and share buybacks. I mean, it's, it goes back to the same drip, drip, drip in a way. Management teams have become more confident of late of buying back shares. You know, uh, this is very much normally what the US stock market sees, but the UK has been a bit behind. But we're now seeing it three, four times the amount it was pre-COVID because they see their shares as being cheap. cheap. Mm -hmm. But this just means the number of shares is getting less and less and less. So... Um, You know, some of the UK companies are also looking to relist their shares in the US. You know, they're, they're you know, they're looking at it and going, hmm, the valuation of a peer over there is much higher. I'd like that. Or, you know, cynically thinking some of the executives might think, oh, I can get a pay rise over there. So very short term. And, you know, that shouldn't be the case. We should be, we should have a thriving, you know, UK equity mm. market that can provide both of those things. And with all this M&A activity, it's, it's great in that, you know, money will come back to, in the hands of the managers to reinvest into new companies and new catalysts. But that also means you're losing that kind of opportunity for like long-term compounding of that company. So once the company's taken off the market, it's usually gone. So we will regret it if we don't try and stem the tide of some of these kind of great business, great businesses in Britain uh, and keep them listed here. So, It just goes to, to the point of there's less now supply and demand might start to mm -hmm. increase and therefore, you know, supply demand it, you know, it might be a time to get greedy and, you know, invest in the UK. You already mentioned some sectors which will profit from his policy like consumption. Yeah. 
Shouldn't I invest into British exporters since uh, there's expected a reapproachment with Europe and the reduction of the tariffs? <laughs> exactly. I mean, one of the key supply side shocks, you know, the past, you know, conservative led years was clearly Brexit um, and the deterioration with the relationship with Europe. I don't think you can expect any major reset, uh, but marginal improvement over time. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of scope to broaden access uh, access to the EU for the fi UK financial services sector, but as well as the professional and creative sectors. I mean, we've had stories of musicians, you know, not being able to perform in, perform in Europe due to red tape, for instance. It's, it's just bizarre. Um, and we've also spoken to companies where the levels of paperwork, costs and logistics just make doing business extremely hard. And in addition, companies are struggling to get labor, particularly skilled labor. So any sort of freeing up of movement, movement would be hugely beneficial and positive for economic growth. Could you give us some examples of listed pearls of Great Britain that European may not know and which could profit from the situation? It was very interesting to see the house builders performing mm -hmm. very strongly in the back of the election result. I mean, this has uh, generally been a focus for them pre and it's going to be for the first 100 days in power for them. Um, I mean, you've, you've even heard the slogan today, I think it's get Britain building. So, um, you know, they've got an ambition. They want to build 300,000 homes a year. That's double what it is already. But that was also the Conservatives plan as well. And, you know, it's, it's clearly easier said than done. Uh, it'd be great if they can, uh, but it will be up to the house builders themselves to actually do it. And if the profit's not there for them to do it, then they won't. And the problem we have now is that the um, the house builders have become much more concentrated into larger house builders, whereas you know a number of years ago there was lots of small house builders. But after the financial crisis, that kind of everyone consolidated. But I think house builders are going to be uh, positively um, impacted. And then in terms of other potentially kind of uh, sectors which will be pos positively impacted, we think there'll be a reversal on the ban on onshore wind farms. And, and more planning uh, planning reforms. So this is going to have direct implications for the UK quoted utility companies, so uh, like the national grids and SSEs of the world, ones which are going to be involved in providing grid infrastructure and renewable uh, trans transition. And then I also saw today, um, very interesting, it's actually from the chief economist of the Sir Tony Blair Institute. Mm -hmm. he, was, uh, he was talking up the potential rewards Uh, if the public sector could harness AI. I, I mean, we all know AI is the buzzword everywhere. And you know, some, some of the US companies have, you know, had very, very strong returns on the back of it. And I mean, we've spoken to a lot of companies who are at the foothills of trying to use AI within their own, uh, their own companies. And, you know, there's a lot of excitement, uh, that's for sure. And they can see some of the benefits that come. I mean, we're still early days, but If those, some of those benefits do come through and the productivity gains and cost savings come through, that could be really huge and be a massive productive mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, product, productive growth to these companies. Uh, so there are, there are areas and, uh, and uh, it, you know, I think there's a bit of hope out there that, you know, they could unlock a bit of that potential. In terms of the listed pearls of Great Britain, that, you know, um, I think in the UK, as UK investors, we, we sometimes get a lot of criticism thrown at us in terms of the UK's lack of growth or innovation in the stock market. The, the, main, the mega stocks are kind of focusing on old economy and you know, the, they're the industries from like the 20th century. Um, but for us UK focused investors, this you know, it couldn't actually be further from the truth. If, when you look under the hood a little bit and away from the FTSE 100, which is 80% of the market, you really do get some really exciting companies in it. They, they do get overlooked. So some recent uh, internal research by some other colleagues of mine, uh, Gene Roche and James Goodman, um, they showed to the end of 2023 that the FTSE 250 uh, actually outperformed the S&P 500, which mm -hmm. I think when you tell most people that, they're like, hold on. How, how's that possible? 25 mm -hmm. years up to 2023, the FTSE 250 is uh, 714%. Or 8.7.4 on an annual basis. The S&P was 702, so just pipping it. Um, but what's the surprise is that they both delivered pretty much the same earnings growth. So that's where people kind of they don't realize that that we've actually got these companies that are growing just as fast as the US, and that's because the larger FTSE 100, uh, its average return over that whole time is half, like four and a half, where which is not a surprise because the earnings growth. 
was half again. Mm -hmm. So look underneath and there's some really good kind of companies there. And to show that an even further kind of, uh, uh, kind of example, uh, the work was done for the uh, 30th anniversary of the FTSE 250. This was uh, to 2022 from 1992 when the FTSE 250 uh, existed. And we have in the UK a greater share of 30 baggers. I'll come back to explain what that is than the US. And a 30 bag, what do I mean by that? It's if you were to put one pound in, yeah, you get 30 pounds back, you know, so you, know, you made 30 times the money. And this is a term, um, termed by Peter Lynch, you know, one of the great mm -hmm. investors of his time who wrote a book back in the 1980s called one up on wall street. And obviously you want, you want to get that return, that 30 times your return as quick as you, as you want. And to put it into a bit of context, context over a 10 year period, that's a 40% compound each year, 20 years, that's 18%. And then, then 30 years, that's 12% kind of compound each year, you know, compounding the eighth wonder of the world. So we screened uh, in the UK from 1992 for 30 years out, uh, out of a universe of 1,095 stocks, which are, uh, are legible. 59 were 50 baggers, so 5.4% of the investable universe. Doing the same for the US, you got 42 So given you know, you've had a tailwind in the US of companies like Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, who are all multi, 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 multi bang, bangers with trillions in market cap, for the UK to have picked them is quite a remarkable feat and it kind of points to the quality of these mid cap companies that we have here in the UK. And, you know, it's not, it's not because we've got tech companies either. Like, you know, the weighting in the U S is 27% for tech. FTSE hundred is less than 3%. FTSE 250 is five. So, you know, we, we, we try to look to see what's the common theme here for these stocks. Why, why can these stocks have performed so well and why have they gone under the radar? And normally the common theme is they operate in very defendable niches or like have very high barriers to entry. And uh, they've already got a track record of growth and taking market share. Mm -hmm. And going back to that compounding over 30 years, they need that opportunity to be able to reinvest at a decent rate. So that 12% uh, compounding rate every year. And that's what they can do. They can invest into the, their back their cash, which they're generating back into their own company and compound that over time. So there's simply just some really good quality companies and they've quietly compounded over, mm -hmm. the number th uh, over 30 years. So this goes back maybe to the extreme valuation discount from earlier and the UK and particularly the 50, 250 why it's so, in, so attractive right now. There's a really good history of good growth that mm -hmm. continues, looks to continue and currently sits very lowly valued. So you think it's still fairly valued, the 250? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> They want to modernize them, the medical system. Is this a good thing for pharmaceutical companies like Lexus Klein, or do they have to think that uh, they get less for their products, or do they anyhow make their uh, revenues outside Great Britain? Yes, for sure. I mean, GlaxoSmithKline, AstraZeneca, the other very large pharmaceutical company listed in the UK. I mean, very much they are global, global yes. businesses. You know, you probably less than 5% of their revenues are generated here. But they're, they're a very large employer uh, of, <laughs> of people here. So, you know, for the, for the government, they're very important in terms of a tax revenue perspective. So I think the UK economy, what happens in the elections, for them, it's more... Uh, are they encouraged to invest more here and provide more jobs here mm -hmm. uh, rather than trying to actually create any extra demand for their, their products or their revenue? So I'd say for that, for them, it's in a way sometimes more what's happening in the U S which is important to them and, and what happens with pricing, uh, whether it's Biden or Trump, but you know, that's very much over, mm -hmm. over the top of my head. But still you think that the, uh, the whole sector they will profit from the new uh, political situation? I think so, just because I know that they, they will be deemed very good employers and they employ a lot of people in this country. I think the, uh, the new government, they, they know that. Do they also know the importance of the financial sector? <laughs> Sometimes I don't think so <laughs> from where I sit. I think they do. I, as I said at the, at the, the top of the piece, the, the Labour, they've 
been going around making sure they've, they've spoken to businesses. Mm-hmm. They want to reassure them that they are going to be pro-growth uh, and they're going to help. And I think the biggest help they could probably do is reduce some of the regulation. It's got very heavily regulated. And, you know, so that's just the burden of the costs. Uh, it's just very high. And also just making sure we've got access back into Europe. You, you seem to be quite positive or optimistic for, <laughs> for the stock exchange. Uh, what do you expect from the monetary policy uh, from the Bank of England? Will they support the stock exchange with uh, interest rate cuts? They're, they're independent, so they, they yeah. will do what they do without the government. But obviously, they want a growing economy as well. It's very much beneficial to them, which we've got... <laughs> You know, there's not the greatest um, fiscal headroom. Uh, there's a lot of debt, so they would like to grow the, the country to grow themselves out of it. But in terms of what happened on the day, you know, there was really no significant moves in the gilts uh, in the wake of the election. And, you know, that's not a surprise because the Labour victory was, you know, and of its magnitude was very, very kind of well anticipated. Um, but the Labour has been keen to stress the commitment to fiscal restraint, which I think has reassured the, the bond market. Uh, but there does remain a sense that once government, you know, Labour kind of get in, um, you know, there's going to be a need to adjust to the reality of additional public spending. You know, they do want to improve public services. So potentially there's going to be higher levels of borrowing longer term. And, you know, there's a hope, again, that there's going to be some better relations with the EU to help the growth. So I think um, in practice, for more immediate consideration, you know, the, the BOE actually was unable to speak. Or was it? it was like in a self-imposed communications block out since the election was announced. They, they say they're not going to do anything. We think in the next you know, few days or weeks, we'll, we'll get a clearer view on the likelihood of a, an August rate cut. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you saw some of the banks already cutting their rates. So maybe if there wasn't an election, that could have already come through, yeah. you know, question mark. But inflation is back at the 2% target. So you would expect them at some point to start reducing those levels. And again, and that should help the consumer. Mm-hmm. Uh, mortgage rates down uh, we are, whilst real wage growth is up. So I think the shifting in the monetary policy will will have a much greater impact on guilt pricing rather than any kind of fiscal policy spending mm-hmm. from the government uh, mm-hmm. for the time being. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we've got the, I think the autumn statement, the budget statement will be September or October. So until then, I don't think you'll get much more mm-hmm. uh, from from Labour. Yeah, Duncan, thank you very much for the insight in the British uh, stock exchange. So, and for the hint to look at the, <laughs> at the British stocks <laughs> because the valuation is quite interesting right now. Interview. Absolutely, <laughs> I, I think um, you know we always try and shy away from forecasting. It's you know it's um, it's just too hard. And even when you do kind of try and predict some kind of something politically, or yeah, sure. sometimes the, the the stock market moves in different very different ways, but. The valuation of the UK, especially the FTSE 250, with the prospect of a stable government, whilst other countries are actually unstable, whilst there's positive change in policy, interest rates are coming down, inflation is coming down. I think you know there's a very high margin of safety, and they offer us you know it's quite a compelling opportunity at, at the moment. So yeah, as mentioned before in Graham's uh, article, maybe and Warren Buffett, maybe it's time to be greedy. <laughs> Thank you very much and greetings to Great Britain. You too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Alles Gesagte ist nur die persönliche Meinung von Julia Kistner und daher keine Anlageempfehlung und keine Rechts- und Steuerberatung. Für Verluste, die aufgrund von getroffenen Aussagen entstehen, übernimmt die Autorin Julia Kistner keine Haftung.